Hey everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Words, where we reveal to you the context, history, and other details of scripture that will help you to understand the Bible more easily and see it in an entirely new light. Now today, we're continuing a series on a book of the Bible called Mark, and we are gonna jump right into chapter four. Now, as we enter this chapter, Mark tells us that Jesus is teaching a very large crowd. And at one point, Jesus decides to just get in a boat and go out into the water. Now, this may sound like a random thing to do. Why would Jesus get in a boat while he's teaching all these people? But we have to remember that at the time of Jesus, they had no way to amplify sound like we do today. No speakers, no microphones, nothing like that. Which personally, I think is really unfortunate. Because can you imagine how many times Jesus would have just like dropped the mic on the Pharisees? <laughs> I mean, there's just so many moments when I picture Jesus looking at the religious leaders and just going like this. But the reason Jesus gets in a boat in this particular moment is because the water provided a natural amplification. You'll notice that Jesus often teaches by the water or on a mountainside. And he's going to these places where the acoustics work in his favor. And he can more easily be heard by the massive crowds that he's teaching to. So Jesus goes out into this boat, and Mark tells us that Jesus begins to teach people in parables. Now, this word parables is really important. I mean, this is a hallmark of Jesus' teaching. In the Gospels, we find over 30 unique parables that Jesus shares with his disciples and crowds of people. But what may surprise you is that Jesus actually isn't the first person to teach in parables. Far from it. You know, we often associate parables with Jesus, but the truth is that parables aren't just a hallmark of his ministry. They're a common form of teaching among rabbis in general. In the first century and long before, rabbis would often teach important lessons in the form of parables. We can find dozens of parables from rabbis over the centuries, many of which appear in the Talmud and the Midrash, some of which are actually very similar to the parables that Jesus teaches. And when you think about it, this is still something that we practice 2,000 years later. Pastors today may not teach in parables exactly like Jesus did, but sermons are full of illustrations, stories, analogies that help us to understand the point from a familiar perspective. And that's what Jesus is doing. Sort of. You see, Jesus does teach with references that are familiar to his audience, but not necessarily so that they'll understand. And you'll see what I mean as we move forward. As far as using references, though, that are familiar to his audience, that's definitely what Jesus is doing in Mark 4. Jesus begins his parable by saying, Listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. Now, this isn't just a random reference that, you know, Jesus didn't just think to himself, you know, farming sounds like a fun way to make this point today. He's telling a farming story because he's talking to farmers. He's talking to people who grow their own food, who survive off of the land. And, and even if there are people in the audience who live in town, who don't farm, they're still intimately familiar with how things work. Which means that his audience isn't just going to recognize the main point that he's trying to make. They're going to notice all the details. And this matters. Because in this parable, Jesus mentions four different types of soil. It first begins with a, a pathway where people walk, where, where nothing grows because it's constantly traveled. He then talks about rocky soil, which is soil that might look fertile, but it's shallow and the seed can't root. He mentions thorny soil where other vegetation's growing and overwhelms the seed. And finally, he mentions fertile soil, soil where the seed can truly grow. But there's way more going on here than Jesus just talking about farming techniques, right? It's, it's not even just that the soils represent how receptive or unreceptive people can be towards the gospel, which they do. But this parable is pointing to a much bigger picture that's been building for hundreds of years. By using this analogy of the soil, Jesus is drawing upon imagery from Hosea and Jeremiah and Isaiah. Hosea says, sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among the thorns. 
And Jesus concludes the parable with the statement, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Which is a reference to when Isaiah says, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. In other words, Jesus is pointing people back to the scriptures. He's highlighting those moments when God called people to repent. And that's what this moment is. Jesus is calling upon us to repent, to search our hearts, to ask ourselves, will this message take root? Will this gospel grow in me? But there's more. Because Jesus is also calling the crowd to action. When he says, whoever has ears, let him hear, the Hebrew word that he uses for hear is shema. Now, you've probably heard me talk about this word before. I mean, it's really important to understand Shema in order to fully understand what Jesus is talking about sometimes. Because when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments? He begins with a prayer called the Shema. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And the reason this prayer is called the Shema is because of that first word, hear, Shema. This is a prayer that Jewish people would have prayed every single day. They couldn't hear that word Shema without thinking of that prayer. But here's where things get even more interesting. Shema doesn't just mean to hear. Shema has a deeper meaning. Shema also means to obey. It means to love God, not just in our minds, but with our actions. So when Jesus says, whoever has ears, let him hear, what he's really saying is whoever has ears will obey. Whoever has ears will repent. Whoever has ears will open their heart to my word and let it grow in them. But then that leads us to a really interesting question. What are we obeying? I mean, if we're going to shema, if we're going to listen and obey, then the important question is, Listen to what? Obey what? And this is actually a really important question because it forces us to take a step back from how we can typically read this passage. I mean, it's so easy when we read this parable to focus on the soil, to ask ourselves, what kind of soil am I? How receptive am I to Jesus's message? But before we can really answer that question, we have to first figure out another question, which is, what is the seed? I mean, how can we know what kind of soil we are unless we know what the seed is? How can we know how receptive we are to Jesus' message until we really know what that message is? And that's what Jesus goes on to tell us and his disciples in this next section. Remember what I said earlier. Jesus is talking to people using familiar references, but he's not necessarily expecting them to understand. I mean, as soon as Jesus finishes telling his parable, he says this to the disciples. He says, to you has been granted the secret of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything is in parables, so that they may look closely and not perceive, and they may listen carefully and not understand. People who aren't ready to receive his word aren't going to understand all of this. They'll just hear parables. But what's really interesting here is that even his own disciples don't understand. And we notice this as we go throughout Mark's gospel. There are so many moments when the disciples just don't get it. They don't understand who Jesus is and what he's saying and what it all means. But I mean, let's be honest, right? Aren't aren't we all like that sometimes? We put up a good front, but sometimes we feel like we have no idea what Jesus is really saying. I mean, am am I the only one who feels this way? We have all kinds of questions about God that we cannot answer. Maybe later in life, we'll look back and it'll all seem so obvious, but in the moment, we're just clueless. We put up a good front, but sometimes we're just pretending our way through. Well, that's where the disciples are. They just don't get it. And so Jesus breaks the whole thing down for them and for us. He explains what each type of soil is and how that reflects our receptivity to the gospel. But then he does the other really important thing that we all need him to do. He explains what the seed is. Remember, we can't figure out what type of soil we are until we know what the seed is. And so Jesus explains it. He says, the sower sows the word. Over and over again, he says that the seed is the word. But here's what's so important here. What matters is 
what word? Because the word isn't just the truth about who Jesus is. It isn't just a promise of heaven. It isn't just a word of hope. It it includes those things. But what Jesus is talking about, this seed, this word, is something so much bigger than that. And we actually have to go to Matthew's gospel to see it all spelled out for us. Because in Matthew's version of this parable, Jesus says that the word is the message about the kingdom. It's not just part of the message. It's not just believing that Jesus is the Messiah. It's not just praying a prayer and going to heaven. It's not just reading your Bible for guidance on life. It's the whole message of the kingdom. Jesus is talking about this bigger message of what God wants to do in this world. This broken world filled with violence and hatred, hunger and poverty, sickness and disease, selfishness and greed. This world that is so different than what God designed and desired. And Jesus is saying to the people living in that world, people oppressed by an empire who has invaded their land, people who live in a world where they and everyone they know is poor, people who have seen the systems around them destroy them and everything that they love, people who live in a kingdom of violence. These people hear Jesus saying that a new kingdom is coming. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's when God reigns on earth, when the whole world worships God, when everything is restored to how God intended it to be. It's not just an event that happens. It is an entire way of life. It is a transformation of the world. And with that in mind, I want to invite us to look at this parable again. Realizing that this word about the kingdom isn't just a promise that God is going to rescue you or me but that God is going to restore this whole world. It's about God helping and healing people, which sometimes may include you and me and sometimes may use you and me. Because instead of just fixing your life or my life, God might be giving you and me the seed so that we can be a part of helping put somebody else's life back together. We can be the vessels who share this word about God's kingdom with them. And so Jesus' question now is, are you ready for that? Are you ready to act upon that? Are you ready to go out into my world and tell people this good news? Are you ready to be a blessing to others, even if there are moments when it doesn't necessarily bless you? Are you ready to be a part of this bigger thing that God is doing to restore this world? And are you ready to give up everything in order to be a part of it? Because this is what Jesus is inviting us to receive. This is where the message of the Bible takes us not only beyond the words, but beyond the walls. When we realize that hearing doesn't just mean listening and believing, it means obeying. It means acting. It means looking for ways to be part of the work that God is doing in this world and joining in. Because if there is any theme in Mark 4, it's this. Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God, and he's inviting us to join him in bringing God's kingdom here to earth. I mean, we saw it at the very beginning of Mark 1, and we're seeing it on a whole new level here in Mark 4. Because as soon as Jesus finishes explaining this parable about the sower and the seed, he jumps right into another parable. He talks about a lamp and how you don't hide a lamp. You put it on a stand. You you want that light to shine brightly. And again, he says, if anyone has ears, let him hear. He's challenging people to obey. But then at the end, he says another really interesting statement that often confuses us. He says, for whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, far too often, this is interpreted as some materialistic sort of thing, right? People who have a lot of things will be blessed with more things, or people who have been blessed by God will be even more blessed. I mean, it turns into a situation where God shows preferential treatment. But that's not at all what Jesus is saying. I mean, this is one of those moments where we have to look at everything that's been going on and put all of those pieces back together. Because remember, right, Jesus has just said, whoever has ears, let him hear. Whoever is ready to receive this word, let him, let them obey. And so what Jesus is really saying here is that those who have decided to embrace this message about the kingdom, 
those who are sharing this message with others, those who are taking part in bringing this kingdom to earth, those who are tasting the kingdom because they're working alongside Jesus to make this kingdom a reality, they will experience more of that. They will experience even more of the kingdom. They will have even more opportunities to see God at work. They will be able to work even more closely alongside Jesus. They will experience even more of the Holy, Holy Spirit. They will experience more of that. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Right? You've had moments when you truly surrendered yourself to God. You dedicated your life to helping those who were poor or sick or suffering. You saw the needs around you. And you chose to follow Jesus and to be his hands and his feet. And when you did, you began to see God's kingdom come to life right in front of your eyes. You felt the presence of Christ. You saw the work of the Holy Spirit. You witnessed the kingdom of God. The more you poured your heart into it, the more you experienced it. The more you relied on Christ, the more he showed up. This, this is what Jesus is calling us to right now. He's saying to us, whoever has ears, let them hear. Let them obey. Let them come and follow me. And maybe for you, this is going to be the first time you surrender your life to Christ in this way. You see the work that God is doing around you, and for the first time, you jump in. For others of you, you're returning to what you've known before. You witnessed it once, but maybe you stepped away from it for some reason. And Jesus is calling you back. And then for others of you, you're in it right now. Jesus invited you and you joined it and you never left. And praise God for that. But this is Jesus' message for us in this chapter. And this is what I want all of us to know Jesus is saying. Jesus says, my kingdom is coming and it's here. And I want you to come join me in building it. Come work alongside me. I mean, we see it in the parable of the seed that grows by itself in verses 26 to 29. We see it in the parable of the mustard seed in verses 30 to 40. Over and over again, same message. Get beyond the walls of your church building. Get beyond the walls of your home. Get beyond the walls of privacy and comfort that you've constructed in your life and come join me. Come see if you don't witness the kingdom of God like you've never imagined. A kingdom that takes root in your life and spreads through your life 100 fold. But here's the thing I need you to know. And Jesus makes this clear. This isn't going to be easy. Jesus isn't inviting us to the safe path. Right? The kingdom of God requires sacrifice. The kingdom of God is going to bring enemies into our lives. It's going to bring resistance. Joining Jesus on this journey is going to require some incredible faith. And that's actually why I think this last little section of Mark 4 is such a powerful way to end it. As the chapter draws to a close, Jesus and his disciples are in a boat. And while they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, Jesus falls asleep and a storm begins. And one thing you should know about storms on the Sea of Galilee is that they are treacherous. I mean, they can come up in a minute and they can be devastating to the boats who are caught in the water. And so the disciples are scared for their lives when this storm comes. I mean, they are freaking out and they wake Jesus up. And they're like, Jesus, how in the world can you sleep through this, right? Aren't, aren't you afraid of what's going on right now? And Mark tells us that Jesus stops the storm. And then he looks at his disciples, and I want you to pay attention to what he says to them. He says, why are you fearful? Do you not yet have faith? I mean, you see what I've done. You've seen me heal people. You've seen me perform miracles. I've told you who I am. Do you not yet have faith? And, and let me be honest, right? This is a phrase that I feel like Jesus says to me all the time. Do you not yet have faith, Brandon? I mean, as many times as God has answered prayers in my life, as many times as I've seen God guide me to exactly where I need to be, as many times as I've experienced Jesus save me from my sins, my mistakes, my fears, as many things as I've seen, Jesus still has to look at me and say, do you not yet have faith? 
And maybe you know what I'm talking about, right? Maybe you've experienced powerful transformation in your life, or you've experienced the presence of God in undeniable ways. You've seen the Holy Spirit do miracles, but Jesus still has to look at you and say, do you not yet have faith? Because that's what it takes to join Jesus on this mission of building God's kingdom on earth. It's going to take faith. We're going to go through storms and Jesus is going to look at us and say, do you trust me? And so to end today, I want to pray for you because I know for some of you, you want this. You want to hear Jesus. You want to obey. You want to work alongside him. You want to experience the kingdom of God, but you're afraid. Something's holding you back. And I want to pray for you to have faith. A faith that doesn't just exist in your mind, but a faith that drives you to action. And so if, if you want, join me and let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this gift of your word, for this good news that your kingdom, your reign is coming here on earth. That those living in a kingdom of pain and suffering and injustice and brokenness may experience a new kingdom. And I know that for some of us watching right now, we feel like we're living in that broken kingdom. And we want to experience your kingdom. For others of us, we've gotten a taste of your kingdom and we want to help bring that kingdom to others. And so we pray, Lord, that wherever we are, you'll help us to have faith to trust you in the storms, to trust you with our fears, to trust you so much that we don't just talk about it, we act on it. We don't just hear, we obey. Help us to obey, Lord, to surrender every bit of our lives to you because you are our Lord and you are our Savior. And it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to go down below and click that thumbs up to say that you like the video. And then while you're down there, click that subscribe button and the bell next to it so that you hear about these videos as soon as they're released. Also, if you haven't already signed up for our monthly newsletter, then check out the description where you'll find a subscription link. Each month, we will take you beyond the video with insights and details that I actually couldn't include in videos like this one. We'll take you beyond the words helping you to see familiar scriptures in a whole new way. And we'll take you beyond the walls, helping you to see how you can live all of this out and be a part of bringing God's kingdom here to earth right now. And so I'm really excited about this. Please take a moment, go down, check that out and subscribe. And again, thank you so much for taking the time just to watch these videos. I'm incredibly grateful for that. Until next time, have a great week and God bless. Mm -hmm.